Hello. So good to see you again. Welcome back to the gallery of curiosities. I will be your host for the evening, Leopold. Today's exhibit is a unique spin on an old fable involving some industrious ants. Of all the insects, ants are the most like humans. They live together in societies with regimented job systems. They build great cities that rise up from the dust. Their most human-like qualities, however, may be when they're infected with the fungus Ophiocordyceps. It hijacks their minds, causing destructive and antisocial behavior, allowing the fungus to spread. Yes, friends, ants suffer the same effects of social media that we do. This evening's exhibit comes by way of Lewis Evans, a sci-fi writer with work in analog, Interzone, Escape Pod, and more. He lives in Brooklyn with his partner and two cats named after fictional detectives. He's almost certainly not infested with a mind-controlling fungus. Or so he says. It could be the fungus speaking through him. We may never know. It will be read for us by Mr. Darren Callow. The ants, the grasshoppers, the locusts, and the fungus. By Lewis Evans. It was a fine summer day. The sun was up, the air was warm and moist. The cuckoo shrikes were calling in the trees, and under a tall stand of golden grass, the grasshopper was fiddling away. He fiddled a warm and sprightly jig, and he fiddled a jaunty reel. And just as he began to fiddle a sweet and loving waltz, just then, a dozen carpenter ants came up and cut through the grass. Pardon me, exclaimed the grasshopper, leaping out of the way as the stiff stalks came tumbling down. What are you doing? We are storing up grasses for the long dry winter, said one ant. Grass for the hill, crops for the queen, buzzed the other ants. Could you possibly leave me a few shrubs to eat and a tall grass to sit under in the hot sun? Asked the grasshopper, sitting under a different stand of grass a little way away. No, said the one ant, and all the ants cut down that grass too, chanting, grass for the hill, crops for the queen, as they did so. And so it went. For all the long wet summer, that whenever the grasshopper would find a pleasant rise or hollow to fiddle in, under the shelter of some greenery, soon enough a cohort of carpenter ants would come and cut those plants down, until the grasshopper was reduced to sitting in a hole in the dust. And then the seasons changed. The wet summer left and it was a long, dry winter. The ants went back into their hill, and the grasshopper shivered in his hole. He was starving. But there was nothing to eat as far as he could see. The ants had cut it all down. So, desperate, the grasshopper hopped and he hopped until he reached the door to the ant colony. At the entrance to the anthill stood two mighty soldier ants. The grasshopper bowed, and he scraped, and he begged the ants for something to eat. 
the soldier ants laughed at him. And one said, Haven't you stored up any grain of your own for the dry season? No, said the grasshopper, for wherever I went, your ants cut down the grass and took it. Probably too busy playing his stupid fiddle, said the second soldier ant, not listening to the grasshopper at all. The first soldier laughed again. Making music, were you? she said. Then dance. And they drove that grasshopper away, leaping and bounding into the starving cold. Moral There's a time for work and a time for play. The grasshopper sat in his hole in the dust, and he starved away towards death, his fat dwindling and his carapace growing dull, and his plates of armour rattled hollowly on his thin body. He raised his legs and began to fiddle a slow air, a dirge, a death song. And the buzz and the drone of the dirge echoed across the barren land. And then the grasshopper heard other fiddlers replying with their own dirges. And over the dust and dirt came the other grasshoppers, hopping, hopping. They came from as far away as half a mile. Dozens, hundreds of grasshoppers. Everywhere there was famine. Everywhere the ants had taken all the food. All the other grasshoppers wept and fiddled together a reel of unwinding and said to each other, It is the dying time. Come again. But the grasshopper, our grasshopper, remembered how the soldier ants had mocked him and shame burned within him and cried out to be avenged. So he leapt up onto a rock and scraped out a single shriek to call for silence. Why should we die? Just because the ants have stolen everything we need to live? Why should we starve when less than a foot away the ants have a granary large enough to feed all of us and all of them too? Let us take back what was taken from us. Let us live. And the grasshoppers cheered and shouted, and in a great crowd they hopped up to the mouth of the anthill. Stop there, cried one of the guards, a soldier ant. And the grasshoppers fell on her and tore her limb from limb from limb. And with their starving mandibles, they tasted ant flesh and found it good. And they stormed into the tunnels, trampling the worker ants they found, hunting for the great ant granary where they could feast away their starvation. But the independent and artistic grasshoppers had no training and no gift for war. In the tunnels of the ant hill they grew confused and their numbers were divided. And deep beneath the earth, the soldier ants mustered for battle. The grasshopper slowed. He turned around. He was in a chamber at the intersection of many tunnels. It was dark, and he had lost his friends and lost his way and knew not how to find either. He fiddled a little, nervously. In the air, in the tunnels, a sudden sharp acrid stench. The pheromone trumpeters calling... Charge! Charge! And from every tunnel by every grasshopper they came boiling. Soldier ants, their mandibles wide to tear head from thorax, their bodies thickly armoured, battle-tested from the ant wars, well fed on all the grass stored up by the worker ants. And they shattered the bodies of the grasshoppers, and they ripped their wings and their musical legs from them and left them to die in the tunnels as Ikor spurted from their bodies. 
and the grasshopper's fiddle screamed in terror, and the anthill screamed like a charnel house, and the grasshoppers bounded here and there, seeking their freedom, and everywhere they leapt were the soldiers' mandibles, ripping, tearing, slicing, and the grasshoppers knew they were going to die, and they died knowing, died by their dozens, by the hundreds. And the grasshopper, our grasshopper, by some fluke of fate or by the unearned mercy of an unfair god, found a tunnel that led to the surface. And starving though he was, weary though he was, he leapt as though he'd never leapt in his life. He leapt toward that tiny circle of light, toward freedom. He almost made it. On the final bound, a soldier ant scuttled from a side tunnel and grabbed him by the ankle. The grasshopper kicked. The soldier ant's jaws slipped. But before the grasshopper could escape, the soldier screamed the suicide scent and autothesized, spasming her muscles and rupturing her acid sac. Her face exploded in poisonous ooze which stuck and burned the grasshopper and he limped out into the wilderness back to his hole, wounded to the edge of death. He was the only survivor. Moral No matter how desperate the need, nor how just the cause. Disciplined soldiers will still slaughter an untrained throng. Above ground, in the barren drylands, it was the drying season. But inside the anthill, life was good. There was plenty to eat and plenty of company. The handful of soldiers who had died in the unprovoked grasshopper invasion were mourned with full honours, and they were interned in the great subterranean mausoleums, and ant poets eulogised their courage and their sacrifice. It was winter, the dry season, when every ant keeps close to home and hearth, a season of culture, of art, of high society. A season of children and family, of nursery and schoolhouse. When the next generation is brought up in the noble traditions of the ants. A season of faith and feasting, where each day brings a new holiday honouring the queen and the eusocial gods of caste and tunnel. And then a new faith came into the hive. Its prophet was a humble worker ant who rose from her place at the end of the great banquet hall and proclaimed that she had been given a vision by a new god. We must go to a high place to worship near the heavens, she said. Ant said she was foolish and when she repeated herself, they said she was mad. For in the dry season, the ants do not venture abroad. But some of the ants, especially those who sat near the prophet at table, started to think that maybe she was right. A new idea came into them, and they also thought that it was a holy thing to go to a high place, to find a tall plant and climb up it, and hold on tight in honour of the new god. And in their eyes they began to see the dim form of their rising god, the thin tendrils snaking and growing. The Queen's Regency Council declared the new faith a heresy and anathematized its prophet. She was taken and sentenced to die, and she was drawn and hexed, her body ripped into six equal parts. But now, 
there were soldier ants who began to worship in the new faith, partaking of its sporing sacrament, eating the sacred dust and seeing for themselves the vision of the higher place, feeling within themselves the holy urge to climb. The regents ordered that every believer be burned alive to staunch the crisis that some called heresy, others called rebellion, and yet others named contagion. But it was too late. Half the hill were believers, or near enough, and when the orders went out there was war, civil war. Soldier ant and soldier ant tore each other limb from limb in the dark. Sister hacked at sister. Workers drowned larvae. Even the pampered drones bit and clawed and died. And then, at last, the heretics took the throne room. And they slaughtered the Regency Council. And they held the Queen down. And force-fed her their sacrament, the spores of the Cordyceps fungus. And the god fungus grew within the queen. And it travelled into her brain, and it touched her nerves and gave her new thoughts. We must go to a high place, to worship near the heavens, said the queen. Near to the heavens, murmured the ants, those that could still speak. Near to the heavens. And they left the hive and climbed a tree together. And they climbed out onto the leaves in the sunlight near to the heavens. And at the stroke of noon, the ants seized the leaves in their mandibles in a death grip. And there they stayed. The zombie ants, frozen in religious ecstasy. And the god fungus grew and swelled within their skulls, and its high feasts swirled throughout their bodies, filling and fortifying them, and it erupted out of their heads in a great stalk, and the fruiting body swelled and burst, scattering their spores throughout the sky. Moral Beware the new gods. Do not partake of their sacraments. Do not admit them into your flesh. Do not eat the spore. Keep the flesh pure. Do not go to a high place. All the ants were dead. And all the grasshoppers were dead too. Safe for one. The grasshopper. Our grasshopper. The once joyful fiddler yet survived. In the hole in the ground he was badly scarred. Torn by mandible and scorched by sticking acid. And yet he lived. In his hole in the ground, hungry and wounded, he fiddled a quiet, enduring folk tune. But though the land was barren, yet there was enough food for a single grasshopper. Poor plants and scraps, left behind by the ants, but enough. And so, carefully, Hard day by hard day, hungry week by hungry week, the grasshopper endured. The weeks passed, the months passed, the seasons changed. Dry winter gave way to wet spring, wet summer. The plants grew green and moist and strong, leaping up from the ground. With no ants to trim them, they grew wild and mighty, and the eggs laid last summer by the grasshoppers began to hatch. It was a new world, a green and joyous world, 
and the grasshopper fiddled a green and joyous jig with his green and joyous legs. He felt something stir within him. And the serotonin rushed up within the grasshopper, and his body changed. His middle thickened, and his proportions shifted, and his green armor became black and yellow. His solitary life had no more appeal, and now it seemed like such good fun to go about in the crowd of the new grasshoppers, who were all black and yellow too. It was a joyous time, and they fiddled together, not a song, but a high and endless buzz, a shout of life. There were hundreds of them, thousands, myriads. And suddenly all the plants were gone, gobbled up. But that was no matter. The locust swarm buzzed as one, and it rose into the sky, ready to devour parts unknown. Moral The plague lies within you, waiting. Evolution has its own purposes. It will not save you when you need it most, but fear not. The plague still waits within you. Oh, yes. The locust plague went forth across the face of the earth, and death followed in its wake. The grasshoppers ate whatever they pleased, and when they were finished there were no crops, no plants of any kind, nothing but dust and a ruin. And they moved over the surface of the earth with the changing of the wind, and wherever they went was devastation. Insects died, and animals, big cats and little deer, and crocodiles, and hippopotamuses, and elephants, and giraffes, and the great apes, including humans. For even a small insect is death in the swarm. And the humans saw this, and they said, this will be stopped. They did not know the story of the starving grasshopper and his lonely fiddle, and they would have shown no mercy even if they had known it. The humans loaded their planes with spores. Metarhysium acridum, and they flew above the swarm of locusts, low and slow. And the fiddler, the grasshopper, laughed and danced as he flew, the buzz of the swarm and the buzz of the planes echoing off each other in a mighty harmony. But the humans had not come to sing. They came to kill. The plane's bellies opened, and the spores rained down upon the swarm. At first, the locusts kept flying, but then the sickness came. Spores clung to their flesh, and fibers grew through their bodies, and they fell from the sky, fell from their jumps, their joints seizing. Their bodies twitching, immobilized in agony. And the infection spread. And they died. They all died. And the grasshopper, our grasshopper, who had fiddled and fought and survived and transformed, the spores were on his skin and in his flesh. They were targeted to kill him. The wax of his coat turned a deathly red, and his wings rotted in their sockets, and he shuddered and he died. Without even fiddling, a final tarantella. 
the fungus grew on the living locusts. And they died, and it grew on the dead locusts, and they rotted, and the fungus was in the rot, and it was the rot. And the mycelia threads spread out on the ground, connecting with other fungus, one flesh at last. In the end, the fungus always wins. To the fungus there is no moral, there is no story. It lives, it swells, it consumes. It expands in both darkness and in light. It is the other brother to animal and plant. The other brother to both life and death. Stronger and more enduring than either. The immortal fungus brotherhood was here before and will continue long after too. There are more things in heaven and earth and they are rooting, waxing, fruiting, sporing, multiplying. Moral, the fungus always wins in the end. It might surprise you to hear that I identify with that grasshopper. I've always wanted to be part of a plague. Groups, gangs, neighborhood associations, they're all fine, but there's nothing quite like a swarm to make one feel like they're part of something greater than themselves. The voice you heard in tonight's exhibit was that of Darren Callow, a writer, voice actor, and musician who is based in Hove on the south coast of the United Kingdom, a medium-sized cannon shot from the English Channel. He has also lent his voice to Brighton Theatre of the Air and 2-Bit Productions' audio dramas. He also finds time to record tales of New Albion, his own steampunk podcast, featuring original comedy material and readings of his sci-fi stories. And now, friends, to send you off with one of my favorite traditional toasts. May we get what we want, what we need, and never what we deserve. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. Story copyrights remain with the authors. This episode was produced in September of 2021. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. You know, I didn't like mushrooms at first, but now they're growing on me. I should probably get that checked.